offspring first. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
feel like you're, some of you just need to sing a melody that you've never sung before, or lift your hands like you've never done something out of your comfort zone as a sacrifice to him. You can clearly hear the voice of the Lord. You can clearly hear the voice of the Lord. This woman can hear the voice of the Lord as well. Let's hear what he has to say to us today. This word is for specific ones, yes, but it, it is for all. I have heard you, my children, and you say, Lord, I hear all of these songs on freedom and being set free. I hear all of these songs on your love for me. But Lord, I cannot receive that. Lord, how can I receive that when I see myself, when I know my past, when I know that I am not free? I am tormented day and night, Lord, by my past. How can I sing these songs of freedom? How can I sing these songs and know that your love is for me? The Lord wants you to know, children, it is not what you are going to do that is going to set you free. I'm not looking for a perfect performance. I'm looking for a perfect heart, a heart that is set on me. It is not what you're going to do. It is what you believe, my children. It is what you believe that is going to set you free. It is what you believe that's going to get you on the new path. Remember that the old is gone and the new has got to come. But the new cannot ever come until you truly see yourself free. You have to speak yourself free. You have to see yourself free. You have to get in my word and you have to know what my word says about your freedom. What my word says about my love for you. I love you no matter what you do. I love you when you're bad and I love you when you're good. My love doesn't change with your performance. So I want you to know today. Be set free, be set free, be made whole, and sing these songs by faith. Sing them by faith, move by faith, speak by faith, love by faith, and receive by faith today. Amen. Good morning. Psalm 18, verse 16. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of, my, out of deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. God is really good. really good just just think about 
Just think about how full this room would be if it was only people that had earned his redemption. There wouldn't be a single person in here. Let's go back to Psalm 139. <laughs> It's funny whenever I thought I was going to read Isaiah 40 and talk about how two chapters before, you know, a, an angel of the Lord slew 185,000 men in a single night. You know, isn't it interesting that Iran has now directly attacked Israel? Isn't it interesting? And, you know, I, I was reading Joshua. Joshua 1, be strong and courageous, you know. And then the first thing that he says to us is, <laughs> he does not treat us as our sins deserve. <laughs> he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I, ri when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out. In my lying down, you are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. <laughs> The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you whenever I was made in the secret place. Whenever I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O oh God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord, and the poor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. God is good. Everything he does is good. And he's literally inviting you to say, Lord, I'm here for you. In spite of every bad thing that I've done in my life, I'm putting it behind me. Oh, I was thinking about this earlier. I liked Toby Keith. Toby Keith, his last performance, he got up and sang, don't let the old man in. There's a lot of spiritual implications to that song if you use it in the right context. 
don't let what you've done in your life previously stop you from having a relationship with the creator of the universe now. Don't let your own thoughts hinder your progress and your walk with God because those are not his thoughts. Those are your own. He has nothing but good thoughts in store for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And he loves you. Everything he does is good. Forget about everything that you've done. This next song, ask him to forgive you of every sin that you've ever committed and lift up your hands and worship the creator of the universe because he is good.
but for a touch of heaven. Do you ever wonder why sometimes the Lord speaks through multiple people? Could it be that he's trying to get your attention? I have a word for single moms in here. And can I just tell you, I feel God's heart for you. He loves you so much and he's proud of you. He just, the Lord says, do not fear. Do not be afraid of tomorrow. Do not doubt me. God says, I was with you when you had that child and I am with you now. The Lord says, I will be with your son and your daughter on their first day of school. I will be with your son and your daughter when they're waiting at the bus stop and I will be with them when they're on the bus. He says, I will provide for you when you need new school clothes. When your child wants to join ballet, when your child wants to do rural rangers, whatever it is, the Lord says, I will provide for you. I will be with your son and daughter when they're at school and somebody tries to pick on them. I will be in the car on that first day they start driving. I will be there when you have whatever need that you have. God says, nothing surprises me. He says, do you think I was surprised by events or circumstances? Do you not know that that is my son and my daughter that you're raising? Do you think I would abandon you? Do you think I would abandon them? They are the apple of my eye. I will make sure they have everything that they need. I will be with them when they start dating. I will be with them when they choose their spouse. I will be with them when they come into the church to get married. I will be with them when they have children. I will be with them on the important decisions. They will not lack. I will give them wisdom. I will give them insight and understanding. I will help you, the Lord says, when you're tired and you're worn out and you throw your hands up and say, God, I cannot do this alone. God wants you to know you don't have to do it alone. There is no father like me, says the Lord. And I love those children. And you have no need to fear anything. I will take care of them and I will take care of you. Ain't God good? Man, I don't even know what to say. It's funny because I had a scripture coming up here and then before Miss Nancy came up, got another scripture. And I always think how our service is structured, right? We have our songs, we have a time of means of grace. Then thank, thankfully our pastors believe in the prophetic and allow the elders of the church to speak to our lives. And I mean, by the time the message comes around, you've already been preached to at least four times. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm just like, Lord, why? You know, why do we do that? And, and, and the verse was this. It says, Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. I don't know if y'all know anything about masonry work. It's hard. You got to break some stuff down. Chip it over and over and over again. 
and we are the masons. We get to do his work, right? We get to be his hands and feet. And what does he say? He says, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you can follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You hear these words that have been coming and your heart's been chipping away, but I hear, I see the Lord, I see this spiritually. The Lord breaks a piece off of it and you want to go back and put it back on. The Lord breaks another piece with another word and you want to put it back on. Quit it. Quit being a knucklehead. He's breaking it off for a reason. I'm just the last one. I'm, you know, I'm going to make you laugh, but you're going to understand. Quit doing that. Let his work be done in you. Let his work be done in you. No man can come to the God, to, to Jesus, unless the Spirit draws him. So you're already here. Why fight it any longer? Why fight it anymore? God is here, and his work started long before you showed up. So get your hands out of the potter's hands, right? the mason's hand, and let him do his thing. And I promise you, by the end of this, by the end of service today, you're going to be thanking me because you're going to walk out of here with the heart made out of flesh and all in love with Jesus. Amen? Well, it's my turn to welcome everybody. And I'm so glad to be here. I missed the last Sunday for a soccer game, but... If you're visiting here for the first time or the first time in a long time, would you please, please take a seat for us? Our ushers are going to come by you and give you a connection card. We want to connect with you and your family. We want to help you in every way that we can as a community. Take a seat. For those of you that have already been here more than once, we welcome you as well. We're going to give you the same discount as the new timers. We love you. Welcome to Spring First Church. So welcome to those watching online today. We're always glad that for those who are watching, let's give those online a welcome today, a warm welcome of applause. Amen. It's time to worship the Lord through giving today. And it's what a joy it is to bring our tithe and offerings to the Lord. We give lovingly and cheerfully for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Can we do that? Amen. God bless you. That was, that seemed very uncheerful. Come on, give the Lord a praise today for your cheerful giving. If you need an offering envelope for your giving, hold your hand high. The ushers will see that you receive one. If you uh, are giving online, you can go to the website and the giving tab and uh, there's a place for you to give there. Thank you 
for your giving and, um, and your, for your faithfulness to the Lord. It's through your giving that we're able to do the things that we do. And uh, when I, in, in ministry, missions, if you have missions pledges, mark those clearly on your uh, card, whether it's to support a missionary or support one of the uh, extended ministries of our, uh, of our missions program. And uh, thank you for, for giving to the Lord. You know, God has called us to be good stewards. And part of, as individuals, our stewardship is tithing. And as, as pastors, ministers, our stewardship is also giving and it's also uh, in the management of that. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm just here to tell you that, that uh, when, when you give your tithe and offerings, we do our very best to manage that in the way that God would be pleased. Amen. Um, in all of our years, uh, you know, we don't spend anything that we, we don't, we don't pay people to do stuff that we can do ourselves. If that means build a building, we'll build a building. You know, we only pay for what we can't do or what or some profession that we don't know that in. But um, I'm, I just was thinking this morning as the prophetic word was coming about him supplying our needs and all the times that God has met our needs as a church has been supernatural, miraculous. And um, <clears throat> I often think of this. How much could we do if everybody did their part? I've said this often and I mean it. If every Christian in the world would be a, a giver to the Lord in their tithe, just their tithe, but also bring the offering. If, they, if we were just obedient in, as Christians all over the world, I, I really believe this. The church would be the richest entity in the world and we would be able to do what God told us to do to take care of the orphans and the widows and the poor, that you would never have a welfare program and the government wouldn't have to be involved if the church people would give and the church management would do what we're supposed to do. That's good preaching. And I'm, I'm telling you what, as, as, a, as an individual, I wanna be, I wanna do my part giving tithing and, and, and because it's in our hands to manage that we can do that in a way that we can stand before the congregation and before the Lord and say we've done our best Lord Amen. and for that we're grateful aren't you glad that he supplies our needs what, what, a, what a great word to single moms today but if I could just tell you this too that goes to every parent in the house God was specific to the singles today, but let me tell you something. I just, I just here to tell you that God shall. He says, I shall, He will supply every need according to His riches in glory, and not in your riches. He won't supply your needs by your bank account. He might use it, but He's going to flow through you to get it to you. I'm gonna read the scripture from the New Living Translation today from the book of Malachi where it teaches us to tithe and to give. And, and I'm gonna start in verse six. It's a, it's a call to repentance. And uh, he says, I am the Lord and I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we tr return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And he, he, God says, you have cheated me of the tithe and offerings do to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I love this promise. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. And then it says in the New Living Translation, try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them. 
from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Listen, you need to read that chapter all the way through and see what God says. Read it in various places and, be, and do what, you know, when, when, uh, when, when we tithe, we can, we can expect the heavens to be open to us. Amen. You, when you tithe and give to the Lord, you can say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Amen. He's gonna make a way for you that is, just unbe unbelievable. Come on, think about this. How many times have you said, you're, not, you're just not gonna believe what happened to me today? Yeah, I'm gonna believe it. You're a tither, you're a giver. You can expect some great favor from God through giving. Well, that's good preaching. I gotta get out of here. Lift your offering to the Lord. Lift your hands to God today, whether you give online or whether you're giving in person right now. Just as, as you give to the Lord, just, let's just ask him. Father, we thank you today that you have taught us and given us your word that, Lord, when we're obedient to what you've called us to do, that, Lord, you will bless us. And, Lord, we bring our tithe and offerings today to you, and, and, and we thank you in advance for the blessings that are going to be bestowed upon us that are already on their way. I pray for every individual in this place, Father, as they're obedient to the Lord, that your blessings would fall upon them, and the heavens would be open to them according to your word, according to your promise, and that every need would be supplied. God dropped, as Boaz was the type of God, when Ruth gleamed in the field, drop handfuls on purpose for people this week in Jesus' name. Handfuls on purpose. Wherever it is that the need arises, let the miracle show up and let us recognize how you did it in Jesus' name. Lord, bless the gift of this church to the missionaries around the world and to the every ministry involved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, Spring First family. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you are with us today. We wanna take this time to let you know about a few events coming up here at your church. First, business meeting is April 28th at 5.30 p.m. Dinner will be served and we ask that all members please attend. Next, if you have a child that is planning to go to youth camp or kids camp, deposits are due today. Also, our men's ministry is having their Bible study this Thursday at 7 p.m. Join them for God's word and community. And lastly, we will have prayer tonight at 6 p.m. We invite you to join us as we pray for our families, our community, and our nation. That's all we have for you today. We love you and pray that you have a great week. All right, we've got one more video I wanna show you, but I wanna talk about it just for a second. We have kids camp, youth camp coming up uh, this summer, and we're gonna show you the kids camp video. And I, am, I, I want to uh, just ask you to just ask the Lord, Lord, would you have me to help out uh, another family send their kid to camp? Kids camp is a little bit more expensive than it was when I was growing up. And we've got some, maybe you're here and you're not a family with young children uh, any longer, but if you had kids, you'd send them or you'd at least want to be sending them to kids camp. I'm asking you to think about sponsoring a kid for kids camp. So this is, uh, it's ages eight to 12 for kids camp and then uh, 12 to 18 for, for youth camp, it's $250. Uh, to go, but watch this video. This is uh, a preview of what's happening at our kids' camp this summer.
Doesn't that just look exhausting? Yeah, so if you don't want to go and be a counselor, like a, a sponsor, like in person at Kids Camp, you can still participate by helping us send all of our kids. If you want information on that, check in the Connection Center and we'll help make sure that those funds get to the, the right spot. There's a lot going on here at our church today. The title of my message is from Isaiah chapter 66. I want us to read uh, this in the Passion Translation. Do we have Isaiah in the Passion yet on Pro Presenter? We do not. So I will read it off of, this is one of the things I'm not a fan of with the Passion Translation. Just like translate the whole thing, yeah, and just release it all at once. But they do like chapter at a time. The suspense is killing us. I didn't remember we didn't have it until literally just now. Otherwise, I would have been a little bit better prepared. Isaiah 66. In the passion. It says this, this is what Yahweh says, the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where is the house that you will build for me? That's the title of my message today is where is the house that you will build for me? Where is the house that you will build? This is what the Lord's asking. I think he's asking our church this, but he's asking you this individually today. Where is the house that you will build for me? It's easy for us to like look in the tangible and the physical and say, okay, we're here. We're, we're working on building like tangible, physical kingdom of God, like a, a gathering of God's people here on a weekly basis. That's, it's easy for us to, uh, to understand and like wrap our minds uh, around that part, but the Lord was asking a whole lot more with that question than just where are you building a house for me? You see, because in Isaiah 66, the Lord's speaking to a people that have been completely taken over. I keep hearing on the news, uh, I, was, I was watching golf yesterday and they interrupted golf to let us know that Iran had launched you know, the attacks against Israel and then I flipped over and started watching coverage on that. And they kept saying, this is the first time in history that Iran has ever attacked uh, Israel. And I guess, you know, the nation Iran, since it's been called Iran, but if you understand like the history of where Iran is and all of, all of that, I mean, the Babylonian empire took them over in the days of, of Daniel and in the days of Jeremiah. Isaiah is speaking to a people that are returning to the ruins of a city and they're trying to build this religious system back up. And the Lord's trying to shake the people saying, where's the house that you're gonna build for me? It's what I want us to hear as a church body, but I want you to hear it individually. Where is the house that you're building for the Lord? He goes on, to say, where is the place where I will rest? My hand made these things so they all belong to me, declares Yahweh. But there is one that my eyes are drawn to. How many of you wanna be the one that the Lord's eyes are drawn to? Like, I think that's the goal. When we understand the goodness and the favor of the Lord, we should look at his word and say, Lord, what, what must I do? What must I change? What must I become so that your eyes are attracted to the way that I'm living my life? If I, if I, and it's not so much, yes, it's the actions too. If you read the book of James, uh, there, James is, there's some people that twist the, the whole book because James is talking about salvation, you know, through works, and how many of you know there's nothing that we could do or there's nothing we could have ever done that we could earn salvation? Michael was mentioning that today. Uh, he said, how full would the place be? I'd say, how empty will this joint be if we all had to like earn salvation? Nothing we could do can earn 
right, a righteous standing before the Lord. But James says, if you're truly in good standing with the Lord, if you really love God, then there will be things that you're doing. You're going to be working the works of the Lord. He goes further and says, if you, if you love God and you're saying you hate somebody, then your faith is fake. And that's a pretty big reproach. So there's like this, this tension where we have to engage God by this, through our spirit man. But if our spirit man is, if we're really yielded to God, then there's gonna be proof in how we live out our life. I'm kind of preaching to the choir today. You're here. You're here because something in you is drawn to the creator of the universe and you, and you say, hey, I, I need it is to my benefit that I show up at the place of worship on the first day of the week and say, Lord, I, I give you this day. And, and, and I, need to, I need to re-engage my life with yours. Well, and that's the, the question that we're asking. Where's the house that you will build? And I would say to you that it is important that we do build a place in the community where we can be reaching and bringing people. But the most important thing that we that we do, God doesn't dwell, this is what the Bible says, that he doesn't dwell in temples made with human hands. He's looking to dwell in and through you. So facilities are important. Ministries that, you know, that we're putting together and structuring, those things are, are important, but the, but the main thing the main thing is building the kingdom of God in each, and one of, in each one of our hearts. And we have to be diligent. Every one of, I hope, that, I hope you're taking to heart today all of, the, cha, all of the, cha, the challenging that we do every single day at this church to say, hey, don't take this lightly. We've heard, had you know, only like a couple people like, that have come to our church that were maybe new and didn't understand. Like, what is it that we're actually doing do you, after between song three and four, we always send somebody up here. Somebody said, you know, we're just going good in worship and then you interrupt it. We're not interrupting. It. We're continuing it and challenging, making sure that everybody, like the, like the ship is moving towards the presence of the Lord, like everybody get on, man. We don't apologize for that because we, we want to make sure that, that all of us together and, and most importantly, individually, are preparing a place, preparing a place for the Spirit of God to dwell. I heard Paul Manwaring, one of my favorite guys to listen to uh, teach. He's uh, very brilliant man. And he used to run a prison in England and the Lord called him to ministry and ended up moving to California and, and was on staff for a long time uh, at Bethel. But he, he was doing a word study about, about what it means for us to be the ones who are, are, are care, we're the carriers, we're the carriers of, of God's presence. Like the, it used to be the Ark of the Covenant and like the Lord is looking for a place to dwell. He's looking for a place to dwell. There wasn't a word to describe that. So the priests, like in the Old Testament, came up with one. It's like a real churchy word that you may have heard called Shekinah. And it means a dwelling place for the glory of God to dwell. This, I, this idea that God wants to share his glory with you, you're designed, redemption purchased all of us the right to not have to live in shame and regret all the time. And instead, he's looking to shine his life through you. So maybe you're here today, you, you, you come in and you're like, David, the, the, there's some like seriously awful things that have happened in my life and I don't, you know, how, I, I don't know how I walk away from that or I don't know how God is ever gonna see me any different. And, and the, the grace, the mercy, God is so merciful. And he's not mad at us. But he, but he does have an expectation. And he sets the expectation 
very high, and he says, and I'll help you do it. I'm sending you, I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can overcome anything. You can overcome anything. You can resist temptation to do things you shouldn't do. But there is one that my eyes are drawn to, the humble one, the tender one, the trembling one, who lives in all of what I say. But the one who offers a bull with no humility is like one who kills a man. The one who offers a lamb without contrition is like one who breaks a dog's neck. The one who brings grain offerings with no heart purity is like one who offers pig's blood, which is an abomination to the Lord. The one who offers incense with no sincerity is like one who kisses an idol. They've all chosen their own way, not mine, and they take delight in these disgusting things, so I chose to punish them and to bring them, to bring on them what they fear the most because I called out to them and they ignored me. I spoke and they did not listen, but did what is evil in my sight, and I chose and they chose what I despise. Verse five says, hear the words of Yahweh, you who tremble at what he says. Shame on you, shame on your own people who reject you and hate you, claiming that they do it for my sake, for they mock you, saying, may Yahweh be glorified, let us see you rejoice. And then verse six, everything changes. He says, listen, a sound of uproar is coming from the city, a sound from the temple, it's the thunder of God as he completely punishes his enemies. And then this verse I want us to focus on today. Zion gave birth suddenly even before going into labor. Zion gave birth suddenly even before going into labor. Can we look at that, that verse in the King James Version, KJV, verse seven, Isaiah 66, verse seven. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. This is what I want you to understand today is that your life matters to the Lord. Like you matter to the Lord. Uh, my mom was teaching the ladies yesterday, which let me just take a, a minute and I don't know if I don't know if, if Susan, are you here today? Big Tom, is Susan here today? Or is she recou recouping? I don't think he was listening to me either. <laughs> Susan Steele is our women's ministries director, and her and her team of of women did such an incredible job of putting together what, uh, just an incredible event. So Susan, if you're watching online, your hard work and diligence does not go unnoticed. It was incredible. I, I came, uh, I was helping uh, Amy fix up a couple of tables that her and Aubrey were doing and uh, I cooked the biscuits for her table. She did a biscuit bar theme and it was making me hungry. But uh, I was up here and I just began to like walk through and see all of the creativity, creativity of all of you, you ladies and it was just incredible. Um, I'm so glad that I don't have to do that. <laughs> Decorating is like I would rather fly to Mars with 32 year olds than have to decorate something. I thought that would be funny. But it was an in, in, incredible, incredible event. My mom was teaching to the ladies that the Lord sees you. The Lord sees you. And I gotta make sure and give like equal opportunity for the goodness of the Lord to the single dads today too. Because the Lord, he is scary good. For all of us, he never fails. Your life adds value to this earth. You showing up today adds value to our church. I, I, let me just park it on this for a second. When you're playing your part in this ministry, 
no matter what it is, maybe no matter what part it is, whether it's uh, volunteering in, a, in the nursery or, it, or in our children's church or, or teaching one of the Sunday school classes or working here at a Mother's Day Out or, or playing an instrument or being a part of our security team. Hey, big shout out to the, the undercover security teams here at our church. Yeah. You may not know it, but Spring First is not a soft target. I saw the footage this week. They, re, they released the, the footage recently from the, the shooting there in, at the Lakewood Church. If you're on our security team, don't run away from the gunfire. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be courageous. The Lord's hand is gonna be upon our church. We don't take your safety lightly when you're here. I'm grateful to a police officer even brings the car and parks it out front. I love that. Let the community know, uh, go to the next church. Yeah. You're in a safe place. We've got people here playing a part. You may be sitting really close to somebody that you think is their only reason for being here is just to worship the Lord, but, but they're strategically placed, ready to protect you. We're not gonna tell you who those people are. Hopefully you never have to find out. But every piece of effort that you bring, no matter what it is, it matters in the kingdom of God. It matters. The, the impact that you have by walking around and talking to people and seeing them, touching, shaking hands with people, telling them, hey, I'm really glad that, that you're here. Following, following these two people down here on the front row, on, uh, like knowing who each and every one of you are is a hard act to follow. During the ladies' tea, it had just started, and uh, oh, can, let me just shout out to the, the men's ministry. I didn't even know that you guys were doing this yesterday, or I would have participated with you. Kendall, you gotta let me know next time. I showed up in like golf shorts and a polo shirt, and like our men's ministry here, and men, you, you'd have thought they were at like a five-star restaurant. Black slacks, white shirts, walking around with trays, like serving these ladies, I loved it. But I felt like a little bit uh, <laughs> ashamed because I'm like wearing shorts. I was just here bringing biscuits. <laughs> I didn't know. So I was hiding and there was nobody in the mother's cry room up there. So I snuck in there and was watching. Watching my mom walk around, touch all of the tables. Amy working through talking to everybody. Hey, it matters that we make sure that people know that they're, that they're welcome here. You have a part to play and it's gonna take all of us. This is what I wanna, wanna tell you. If we're asking the question as it relates to our church, listen, God's word speaks to us in, in different ways, in different layers. If, if the Lord is asking, if the Lord's asking the big question in verse one, where is the house that you will build for me? We need to first take very seriously, Lord, the house of my heart has to be prepared for you. I've gotta prepare my heart every single day. Lord, the scripture there in Psalm 139 that Michael was reading, Lord, search me, know me, see if there be any wicked way in me. What a wonderful prayer to pray on a daily basis. Where, Lord, I, 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 I come to you and surrender my heart, my thoughts, my will, my emotions to you. But then also, Lord, what do, what do I need to do to be a part of a community that's expanding the kingdom of God here in, in Spring, Texas? It's what I wanna talk about. I, I, heard, I was talking to another pastor friend uh, of mine that was talking about new, he, uh, it, was, it was David Boyd. He's our national uh, BGMC director 
And uh, now he's on staff with uh, the Bible Alliance, you know, working with Fire Bible specifically. And uh, we were at a Fire Bible conference in San Antonio. We were sitting with him at, at dinner. And uh, he, I asked him, I said, uh, I said, Brother David, how long have you been at the national office doing like children's ministry? He was a national children's ministry director for a long time, national BGMC director. He's just been up there for a long time. And he was talking about how they had been there for like 25 years. And uh, he had been... Uh, there for like six or seven uh, uh, different administrations. And he said, every time somebody new comes in, they think that their job is there to like fix what is broken. And I was listening, he was talking about that because we were talking about the transition our, our church has made. And I wasn't taking that lightly. And I can tell you, I don't think that my job coming uh, in and, and switching roles with my dad is to come in and try to fix what is broken The job is to, to say, okay, look at, look at where the Lord has brought us and where is, he, where is the Lord looking to take us next? So, because if, if we just maintain where we're at, then we have failed. If you listen to the parable of the wise and the foolish servants, uh, if we just say, hey, you know, we've built a, a, a pretty good, like strong, you know, healthy church with faithful people, um, like we have, to, we, have to keep, we have to keep the train moving to what is next. Amen? The Lord is asking us today. I mean, thank God that we, we, we have a, a great history. We've been here for a, a really long time, but what, what is the Lord looking to do? What is next? We're not trying to fix what is broken. We're saying, Lord, show us the path for what is next. John chapter 15, verse one to eight. Eight, Jesus is talking here and he is, he is explaining to us that we are part of his plan. We're part of his plan. He says, I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, everyone say this out loud. I am a branch. He's talking to you. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Ask yourself, is my life bearing fruit that's advancing kingdom work? It should be. I'm gonna talk about ways that we can, that you can measure that and what, you, what do you need to do, change, what do you need to be or become to make sure that your life is bearing fruit for kingdom. Maybe your life is bearing fruit at your job. Maybe you're a valuable asset at your job. Question, big question for you, as T.L. Osborne would say, is, is your life a valuable, valuable, impactful Life for God's kingdom. What does that look like? That means that you're having influence on the people that you're around. Is your life influential towards the things of God as it relates to you personally, to your family, to your church family, and to the people that you come in contact with? We've gotta be bearing fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which... I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's important that we're not trying to just advance our own life in our own power. That seems like a pretty foolish thing to do. We've gotta to surrender to him, to his ways, and let him bring the increase. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples." So bearing fruit in kingdom is seeing answers to prayer. He says, if you ask anything, it'll be done for you. And by this, you will, you'll be bearing much fruit. That means that we, you've got to be willing to start praying pretty bold prayers. About what? I think about everything as it relates to you, to your, for your family, for our church. 
One of the things that we've done in the School of Ministry is challenge people not to just say, oh, you're going through a tough time, I'll pat you on the back. Yeah, I'll be praying for you. Follow the example of Lydia. You have something wrong with you? Can I pray for you? Yeah, no, I'm gonna pray for you right now. Let's be the people that aren't afraid. Oh, that's weird. It's not weird. If you're going through a tough time, you know how many people, if you won't make it weird, it won't be weird. That's good preaching. Don't be one of those like overbearing, awkwardly weird Christian people. Don't be religious. Just be real. Just connect with people. If, you, if you'll just sincerely give a rip about people's life, they'll see Jesus in you. Jesus legitimately cared about people. Amen. Did almost all of his ministering outside of a synagogue. Amen. Moving through the people, finding... And, and because he, they knew that he cared and massive crowds followed him, seeking, pressing in him just to see if they could touch him. Don't be religious, just be real. Your life and destiny matter to God. Look at Leviticus chapter six, verse 13. Your life matters to God. God isn't overwhelmed by all the problems that you might be facing today. Your problems might be overwhelming to you. He's not struggling. The Lord had a big night last night. Yeah. I ran launching missiles, cruise missiles, over 300 something or another's. Drones or cruise missiles, airstrikes of some sort flying at Israel from Iran. That's like big news. The Lord's not stressing. It's amazing how many people you hear, the world's just falling apart. Oh, no, 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 no. This world's falling right into place. Falling right into place. All we have to do is worry about, Lord, just align my heart with you. Lord, align my heart with you. Lord, thank you that your hand is strengthened on behalf of these people in Israel. This church stands with with Israel. The promise from scripture is that he blesses those who bless them and curses those who curse them. I watched a video of the, the Iran, Iranian regime like standing up and facing the direction of the nation of Israel and then chanting in unison together, death to Israel. Mock me, that will not work out well for them. <laughs> in this life or the next. What do we need to be praying? Lord, bless your your people, Israel, and save the people of Iran. In what way? Spiritually, save them. Lord, let them, let them hear an encounter with Jesus. Leviticus 6.13 says, a fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. We've, I preached about this not too long ago. We've got to manage the personal fire. Your life matters He cares of whether or not the fire of God is burning in you. Proverbs 3, verse 35. How many of you want to be considered wise? When you sit in meetings at your job, if you're sitting uh, sitting in a situation or talking to friends or family, I want to be considered wise. I hope that. I hope that I can learn enough from the word of God and from the example of my dad as a pastor that when you're going through difficulties that you can trust the leadership of our church to help you guys in difficult times. But look at this scripture. The wise shall inherit glory. You are, and I, we are redeemed to, 
to have God's glory shining on us. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Romans chapter eight, verse 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these are also glorified. What does that mean? Your life should be releasing, it should be the evidence of God's glory upon your life. That's our prayer for you. How, how are we gonna attain these type things? If the wise inherit glory, what, do I, what must I do to be seen? Remember the, that scripture that we said that, the, that the, the eyes of the Lord, he's noticing certain ones other than he's no respecter of persons, but he knows those who are his and are, knows who are diligently seeking after him. There is one my eyes are drawn to, the humble one, the humble one, the tender one, the trembling one. The wise inherit glory. Proverbs 11.30 says, he who wins souls is wise. You wanna be wise? You wanna have God's hand upon you, his glory shining upon you. Then start telling people about him. What does it mean to be building to be, to be building a house for the Lord personally and then corporately as from our church? Three ways. Number one, through prayer. Starting tomorrow, I'm asking our church to fast for three days. You can do that one meal a day, two meals a day, or all three meals a day, or I don't know if you're one of those people that eats seven small meals a day. <laughs> Heard somebody talking about that. I eat seven, this guy was like working out all the time. Yeah, I do, seven small meals a day. I'm like, you just never stop eating, man. <laughs> Let's not be an Esau church that is selling in spiritual inheritance for a meal. David, you don't know how hungry I get. Tell your flesh to be quiet. Stomach isn't in charge. I'm asking you to fast and pray. Pray for what? Pray for the kingdom of God to be advancing in the earth. Pray for Israel. Pray for this church. Pray for the advancement of, the, of this church. We're working hard. Our, our staff is working hard, looking methodically at, at making the next move to advance this church. We're looking at, at ways to use what we have to launch us forward. It's important to us to to have facilities that are attractive to the community. Nobody wants to go to a church that looks like a dump. And I, I'm part of a Facebook page that always is like posting all this religious things, you know, showing like an old tent, like an old like lean-to where they had like revival meetings like in the 1920s. We're in the 2020s. We're in the 2020s in the United States of, of America. We're gonna have to have decent resources, decent facilities, working on, on these things, building the house and the physical, but then also praying and asking the Lord. I heard Oya Depo talking about this uh, the, other, the other day, building a church, but, but spiritually keeping the grass green. Why? Because he says that he'll cause his sheep to lie down in green pastures. The spiritual temperature of this church matters to me. It matters to our leadership team. It matters to the Lord. We're not taking lightly planning a service or planning a sermon or planning worship. We, when you come here, there are other churches that you can go to that you could get out quicker. We're not here for speed. We're here to make the day count. I think that's an important thing to look at in a church. Well, David, we could have both. If you just talk quicker. 
We could do it. We could sing one fast song, one slow song. Uh, what's his name? Dr. Rodney Hard Brown. We could come in, sing two hymns, two hers, take an offering, have a five minute message and a dismissal. Hey, we're here to make it count. When you, when you come here, you're, you, you're gonna be bombarded by scripture. Oh yeah. Michael's doing means of grace. He reads the entire chapter of Psalm 139. Like thunder. I'm not mad about it. Why? The word of God is powerful. The spoken word of God out of our mouth is powerful. That moment, a very meaningful moment. God's word is what makes, the releasing of God's word from this pulpit is what keeps the grass green. Who cares what I have to say? It, it matters what the Bible has to say. We've gotta be a people of prayer. I'm asking you to skip meals and pray for yourself, for the salvation of your family. Man, we were talking and we had board meeting on a Wednesday night. We're talking about salvation of family members. If you have people in your close family that need to be saved, listen, the coming, the soon coming of Jesus Christ is near. If you have somebody in your family that needs to, to be saved and be right with the Lord before that time comes, would you just stand up? Close friends or relatives that you're asking the Lord. And, and I'm not talking about like, oh yeah, Lord, we just put them in your hands. Like, I, like I, we have to take personal responsibility for the salvation of these people. It's our responsibility. This week, is, this week is a week of impact for the people that you're praying for. There's people on, the, on, on our prayer list. We open up in prayer before we do the business of, the, of our deacon board meeting. We're praying. There's people on the list that we've been praying for for years. They're coming in. We've got to do the work, the hard work of prayer, the travailing in prayer. There's one version, I thought it was King James when we read uh, Isaiah 66, verse seven. One, one version says, when Zion travailed, when Zion travailed, when Zion travailed, the answer came. Here's the thing, that, that scripture that we're reading, let me just read it again to you. And we're gonna pray for these loved ones. Y'all thought I was done preaching. I'm gonna sit you down and go another half hour. I'm kidding. I won't do that to you. A sound, an uproar is coming from the city. A sound, an uproar is coming from the city. What was it? What's the uproar about when your family members come home and serve the Lord? Is there gonna be shouting in your house? A sound from the temple. It's the thunder of Yahweh as he completely punishes his enemies. Zion gave birth suddenly even before going into labor. She delivered a son without any painful contractions. Who has ever even seen or heard of such a wonder. I, I submit to you this, that the day that Jesus was born, a new Israel was born. And they didn't even know it. They had no idea. A son was given to them. And the Lord is building the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ, on the earth. And he's not gonna forsake the physical land of Israel. Here in Spring, Texas, the kingdom of the Lord has to be built.
has to be built in your heart. You have to take personal responsibility for that, but we have to look out for the lost and we've gotta pray. Our church, this place has to be a place of prayer. As a launch of our three days of fasting and prayer, if you don't normally come to corporate prayer, I'm asking you to come tonight. Our house, this house is gonna be a place of prayer. Our prayer meeting on Sunday nights is the boiler room. The boiler room, uh, the engines that, that keep the thing moving. We need you to be a part of that. You can pray, you can fast and pray your family into salvation. You've got to be bearing fruit. Number two, you've got to be telling the testimonies about the goodness of the Lord. If you're going to be bearing fruit, you have to be speaking to others about the goodness of God. I played in a golf tournament on Friday with somebody that works with Michael. Every time Michael's name would come up, the guy found out that I was the preacher. Michael, I don't know how well you know that guy, but he knows your testimony, whether he heard it from you or somebody else. I said, yeah, well, Mike's a good guy. He's come a long way in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, he told me about how good God is. Do people that you see every day know the story of the goodness of Jesus that's happened to you. <laughs> they better. We eat at the same places all the time. We walked in to the restaurant the other day and some guy from across the room yells, and I was, I, at first I was kind of annoyed by it because, you know, I, I'm just here to eat, man. Leave me alone. That was like my, in the flesh. But I walk in and from across the restaurant, he goes, amen. Because he knows I'm a pastor. Does the Holy Spirit ever like just like interrupt your life and go, hey, I'm gonna need you to like change that attitude like right this second. Like before you even say another word to that person that just annoyed you, I need you to see the goodness of what just happened. Like the Holy Spirit's like, don't ruin this, you idiot. <laughs> They're interrupting my dinner. And the Lord's saying, oh no, I thought you gave me life. Your life. My bad. Is the Holy Spirit like sarcastic with y'all? I think he uses like our own thoughts and I'm pretty sarcastic. So he's like, all right, you asked for it, buddy. Can we just surrender to him? We have to be diligent to do the work of prayer. It's, this is not religious activity. This is the hard working. There's something that God wants to birth in Spring, Texas. There's something that God wants to birth in you. But the labor, the travailing has to be done in prayer. This idea, this verse, before they travailed, they gave birth. You look at <laughs> Isaiah. Spread out, shout, throw a party. Sing, O barren woman, you who bore no children. Before you even find out you're pregnant, start throwing the party and celebrating that you've given birth. Because here's the thing, that the Lord births things in, real, in the spirit realm that are true in the spirit ever before they ever become true in the physical. But we have to see it and declare it we have to see it, declare it, 
before it ever happens because we see it and know it's true in the spirit realm. This is how it works. I watched a video of Conor McGregor. Do y'all know who Conor McGregor is? He's in a fight at the press conference. They ask him, what's gonna happen at the fight? He tells them like in his, you know, Irish accent. When he's standing there, you know, they take the picture and they're like doing the face off thing. He said, I saw the guy's right hand twitching. That, that hand is like loaded and wanting to unload on me, but, he's, but when he throws the punch, I will not be there and my left hook will bring him to the ground. And you go watch the fight. They ask him after the fight, they said, here's your exact words and they show the replay. And his words are this, is like, hey, there's something true out there. And when you see what is true, like the Lord is using, some of y'all right now are like, Conor McGregor's not even saved. Yeah, yeah. He uses, he uses the wisdom of the world to confound the wise. I heard him saying that. I'm like, this man is preaching what it, what it looks like to see things in the spirit realm and declare them to be true. Your words matter. You better, talk, you better be talking good things about your life. You better be speaking to other people about the goodness of Jesus. Be an addicted soul bringer. Master the art of come and see. The lady, the woman at the well. I would love to say that I had this like great theological explosion of uh, revelation, but I was talking to a friend the other day. He was talking to me about the woman at the well. Michael, get up here and explain it. Lord showed Michael this, it's powerful. This is powerful. All of you that, none of our church believes that women shouldn't be in ministry. I love it that the Lord uses this woman at the well to be like one of the first recorded evangelists under a new covenant. A whole city gets saved because she goes, hey, come and see a man, come and see a man, come and see a man. There's people here at our church, they need to come and see Jesus, but there's people here that have testimonies that they need to come and see. You need to invite people that have like addictions and strung out lives that are just like he headed to hell in a, in a handbasket and go, man, you gotta come see a guy that Jesus took out of deep waters. We have people like Lydia has a testimony how the Lord, boy, took her and her family out of a miry pit, set her feet upon a rock. Be an addicted bringer of people. Man, you gotta come see the people at our church. You gotta come, man, you gotta come to my church and meet this guy, Omar, who the, the Lord saved from cancer. You meet somebody that has cancer, you, the, you need to tell them, oh, bro, you got to come to my church. We're not afraid of, of, of people with incurable problems. Listen, he, he's going to tell you what he saw from, about this, this woman from John chapter 4. We'll go quick. It's worth it, okay? Listen, we start later now. We're not, we haven't even... We start later. Everyone look at your neighbor and go, just pump the brakes. John 4, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing, was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse four, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town called so he came to a town called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the church, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? That was the last time 
that that plot of land was ever referred to as not the woman at the well. It was no longer Jacob's well. It was no longer Joseph's field. Jesus enters her life and changes the ownership of her circumstances. It's now her well that we refer to that. The woman at the well. You don't ever talk about it, the woman at Jacob's well. When's the last time you ever honestly said the woman at Jacob's well? Not one time has anybody read that scripture and not realized, oh wow, it's the woman at the well that Jesus walked into her life and completely changed the circumstances for the rest of history. The rest of history, everybody refers to it as the woman at the well because that's the encounter that she had with Jesus. And blessed are you, Michael Dean, because flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. What's the point? Some of y'all are like, okay, so he renamed, renamed a well. No, this is the thing. The Lord's looking to take you to places. The Lord's looking to take you to places that have historically been known for one thing, and instead, they're going to be known because of what Jesus is doing in and through you. The Lord's looking to take you to Spring First Church and raise you up as the somebody that God is using to set spiritual pace at, in the house. Yeah, that's right. You just heard that from the pastor. We were at Bethel a couple of years ago. They let this little girl have the microphone named Haley Braun. Amy, call Bethel and rebook Haley. Listen, that, that church, if you ever get a chance to go there, don't read all of like the internet garbage that, about that church. It's like ridiculous. I've met these people. They are generals of the, Bill Johnson is a general of our generation. Loves the Lord. Valatin started a school of ministry that is like changing the earth. They're discipling nations from this obscure town that I only knew because of Monopoly. Redding, California. The Redding Railroad. Reading Railroad. I don't know. I thought that was the same place. If it's not, take it up with Amy. She's the one that told me. I'm kidding. She didn't tell me that. No, I never heard of the town. That was my point. We get there. They've got one of the generals. They've got a couple of the generals there. I mean, I can like list off like their staff. There's like, they, they, they get up and they start like talking and you're just having like explosions of Holy Spirit revelation because like it, the, the well there is so deep. And they give the mic to this little British girl named Haley Braun that came there for school of ministry, goes through their school of ministry. But the Lord is using her in such a powerful way that like the leadership literally just said, hey, like the Lord is doing something special in her. And they're like giving her more and more opportunity. And like the temperature, the spiritual temperature is being driven by this like young girl that you would never suspect. She teaches one day in one of their meetings and she begins ministering and talk and praying for the people people are going down under the power and just the presence of the Lord is so thick in the place. It goes on. She prays for people for two or three hours and gets done and looks around and she's the only one standing left in the room. Everybody's on the floor just weeping in the presence of the Lord. Well, David, that's weird. I don't want to be a, power, a part of that. Man, I do. We were in a meeting in Griffin, Georgia about five years ago. What was that guy's name? No, he's coming. We're get, he's coming to our church soon too. I'll think of it in a minute. 
he starts talking about the glory of the Lord. And as he's talking, the power of God just hits the room. I mean, and we're jammed in this room about the size of the McLaughlin room. And for two hours, I mean, nobody could, nobody could stand up. He just wanted to like, we literally were face down in the presence of the Lord. Give me those moments. Doug Small, one of the generals of our generation. He doesn't know yet, but he's coming to our church too. It's not about the people, but we have to expose ourselves and our children to the generals. Andre Venzal's coming in a couple weeks to our church. Be prepared to be here for an encounter with God. Hey, time is short. It's not a time for us to be like messing around and just playing religious church. It's what I'm trying to tell you today. Your life matters to God, but he needs us to prepare the place for him. This week, three days, spring first, he's gonna fast and pray for the advancement of the work of the Lord on the earth, but the advancement of the work of the Lord here in spring, Texas, and in our English and in our Spanish church. And I want you to fast and pray for the salvation of your family and your close friends. That's taking personal responsibility. Lift your hands to the Lord. And I want you to ask, Lord, would you make this, this week Lord, make it a turning point in heaven because of the work that we're gonna do. Would you just begin to thank the Lord for the people that are gonna get saved? Thank the Lord, call the people's names that are gonna get saved and, 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 and pray a prayer of thankfulness. Lord, I thank you for the salvation of the people that are represented by the ones standing here today. Lord, I thank you for the testimonies that we already see coming. Lord, I thank you that, that we, we are giving you thanks in advance of seeing what is true in the spirit realm that has to be now true in the natural. We say to prodigals from the north, the south, the east, and the west, we say, come home, come to Jesus. We see you saved. I see spring first spreading out. I see branches growing out of this place. I see this place becoming a very deep well of never-ending supply of anointing and favor. I see your families having impact on friends and loved ones. I see people marriages and families restored. I see people being healed because we're pressing in for more of him. Father, increase us in the land. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Lord, I thank you that you're saving our families and that even the hardest of hearts are being renewed in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. We love you here at this church. We want you to be blessed. I want you to join me tonight at 6 p.m. as we launch off prayer and fasting. It's gonna be a great night. Not a time to sit at home. Give Jesus the day. Father, in Jesus' name, bless these people. I thank you for a committed church. Lord, I thank you for people that aren't here to get in and out as quick as we can. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray blessings upon the people. Bless them indeed in Jesus' name, amen. See you tonight at six.